So hello everybody. Um, my name is Otto Rosenberg, as you can see from Intel. I belong to the Vision Computing the Software um, Division. And we're going to talk today about optimizing open scale CPUs. So first of all, um, a small recap to what Kathy said. Kathy mentioned it and I want to repeat that. But OpenCL is what we call platform API. So basically, it supports a uniform programming environment across devices. Um, the goal of OpenCL, using it, should, should be the, to make the best use of all available resources, which are the CPU and the GPU, within a single program. That's the basic idea of OpenCL. That you're probably using all of your devices back together inside one program and one programming one. Um, and we want to mention that <coughs> Intel is coming up with a new generation of processors, which we call the new generation, we call the graphics there, we call the processor graphics, because they bring a new level of integration between CPUs and GPUs. This is already coming from, starting from Sandy Um so what's the challenge today of actually using multi-core CPUs? How many of you are programming CPUs today trying to utilize multi-cores and vector units? So it's a problematic uh, issue to try and unleash the power of the CPU because you have to exploit the multi-core and then you have to exploit the fact that you have SSE registers which are not easily accessible. So OpenCL is a great framework to harness this power within the CPU. First of all, it's very intuitive, as Afi explained to you, to write a program in OpenCL it spans across your device. And it unleashes the performance of CPU by using multi-cores and utilizing <coughs> your vector units without the need to write special code which targets the vector units. And, as I'm going to show you, actually the results can become very close to hand tuned code. Okay. So you keep within your C language, okay, you're using some vector brain types, you may manipulate your code a little bit, but it's still C language, and you're getting very close to your hand tuned SSE. Um, more important than that, we're talking about a performance portable code. We're talking about forward compatibility between CPU generations. When the CPU comes with a new ISA, if your code comes in OpenCL, it automatically compiles on the, for the new ISA. For example, we're going to have AVX, the code compiles for AVX. And that will be the next ISA, the code will be able to compile to that. So this is what we call forward compatibility. In addition, we aspire to have compatibility between devices. Okay, it's inspiring because you need to keep in mind that OpenCL is a rather new thing. We have implementations in the market that need to become more mature to enable actually this compatibility between devices. So let's have a view of how OpenCL is actually mapping out Core i7. So this is part of the spec. This comes from OpenCL platform model, as Effie showed you. And this is our Core i7-975. Well, if you look at it, it has eight compute units because it's a quad-core and it has um, SMT inside, which means that it has eight logical cores. And the number of processing elements that the CPU exposes varies because we have a 128-bit SSC register. So it depends on your uh, computation type. If you're using floats, it means that you have four elements. If you're using chows, you have 16 elements. And we know how to use that, by the way. So in addition, we have a cache hierarchy inside of our uh, CPU. It's, it doesn't appear, it's not part of the programming model in OpenCL, but I'm going to touch it briefly and show you, actually, how using the caches that we have inside the CPU is actually helping you to move from C to OpenCL in a much lighter and easier way. Um, so 
school. We talked about it in the past in the other uh, box, and I want to mention again that there are probably two styles to write OpenCL code. Implicit and explicit data parameters. The implicit one is what every graphics developer knows as shader programming. You write your kernel as what we call a scanner program, which means that you're using vector types which size naturally to your problem. If your problem is a pixel which has four elements, then you're using float four, not because of the fact that we have a register which is four way floats wide, but because float four is your problem basically. Uh, uh, data. And it maps automatically to single computer resources by the compiler and the runtime and the hardware. The developer is not trying to match the actual machine architecture. This is what we, we refer as implicit data parameters. Explicit, on the other hand, is when the kernel is defining one stream of instruction targeting the compute unit, which in the case of the CPU is the logical code. There you get parallelism for resource level wide vector types. The developer is writing the vector types because he wants to target the actual hardware. And there it's important to size the vector types to match the native hardware width. We have a new query in 1.1 which enables you to know what's the native vector width of the machine and the programmer hints the implementation to know that he's writing it in explicit mode. This is the pragma, which is called the vector hint type. Well, the compiler sees that and he knows that he doesn't want to vectorize the, the code. CPU supports both mapping. It's a matter of software, the right software to write, to know how to exploit each one of them. I'm going to focus in this presentation on the first one. I'm going to show you actually how shader-like or implicit data parallelism maps on the CPU. Let's start with a little example. Okay. So n-body simulation, anybody is not familiar with n-body, haven't written n-body or anything. n-body is probably the most widely used example in the world. The idea is that you have particles and each particle is affecting the other particles. It's each particle is uh, affected by gravity forces, and it affects its position and its acceleration. Basically, it's highly parallelized because each particle can be calculated regardless of the others. So each step, you actually need to go through all of the particles in the system, and for each one of them to calculate the influence of the rest of these particles on this specific one. And this is actually what you see here. This is an n-body function, okay? You have an outer loop, which goes on all of the particles. And inside, uh, you have an inner loop, which calculates the influence of all of the bodies on this specific body that you're calculating right now. And then you're updating the position and the velocity. As simple as that. This is a C program, okay? Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the problems when you go and write this code, it doesn't span across your cores unless you explicitly do that. And it doesn't utilize your vector limits unless you write it in SSE or in OpenMP and any other methods. Okay, now let's see how to convert it to OpenCL. So, first of all, we need to replace the headers. Okay. It's a very slight and delicate change, okay? We had buffers, we're keeping the buffers, but now we're just adding the global before them because they come from the global level space. And if you recall, I'm writing my kernel for one point in my data range. So this outer loop here, I don't need it anymore. It's replaced by getting the index and this is the kernel. This is the change. I have a kernel specifying one body, and this is the entire change. And as I mentioned earlier, the fact that we have caches, actually I'm not using local memory here at all, because on the CPU, you're not required to use local memory. 